大家好，我是上海音乐学院赵小红，非常荣幸，今年第二届科雷诺国际钢琴艺术节，我们又将召开钢琴教学法学术论坛。那么今年又是由我来主持。呃，记得去年我们在意大利就是现场举办了第一届。钢琴教学法的学术论坛，邀请了来自世界各地的钢琴家、教授们，呃，大家面对面坐在一起，谈论了相当多的话题，呃，给当时参加的同学和老师留下了深刻印象。今年由于疫情关系，我们只能在线上举办这场学术论坛。但是我们依然邀请了来自世界各地的钢琴家和教授们，呃，欢聚在云上，大家一起来进一步的讨论和探索钢琴教学法相关的学术问题。那么主办方，尤其是柴聪聪老师、王璐老师，他们呢，在这个题目的设计上考虑的非常的。呃，仔细和周到，呃，非常的贴切，而有这个实际的意义。那么，他们这次主要的题目有九个。Well, I'm going to answer that in a general way first.、Um, there's there's a certain amount of research. About the characteristics of different types of piano students, and we get this from some research studies, and we also get it from、uh, uh, figures from how many people are taking music exams and things like that. So, let's think about 100% of the piano students of the world, and we find that only about from seven to nine percent go all the way on and study at the advanced levels. At the other extreme, <clears throat> we see usually something like.、Hmm, 12% to 15% maybe just don't like playing the piano at all, are not serious about it. They only do it because their parents make them, and as soon as they can, they quit. So, the vast volume of piano students are going to be somewhere in the middle of those two extremes. So that's what 60 or 65% of the students like playing the piano sort of, or like playing a certain kind of piece. So. Your expectations of what piano students are going to be a little bit depends on what kind of a teacher you want to be. So, if you want to be a teacher of those advanced students, that means first of all, you have to get your own skill level very high, because you have to know a lot about the mechanics of playing the piano, about pedal, about tone, all these high-level things <clears throat> take a lot of study for you. So it could be that maybe you are more comfortable just working with those mid-range students and having them enjoy music and love it in their own lives, and not necessarily be so serious or be re required to practice so much. <laughs> Nobody should have to practice those lower category or the lowest category of students, but sometimes we don't have any choice. So, for myself. <laughs> When I was a little boy, my grandmother said, "Scott, you have a very short attention span because you always like to do lots of different projects." And now, 60 years later, I'm happy to tell you she's absolutely right. <clears throat> I do like to do lots of different projects. So my expectations of what students should be doing depends a lot on what their goals are. I expect my conservatory students to be very serious and be part of that seven percent. And we're very picky about details, and I expect them to practice a lot. However, when I'm teaching pedagogy to my students, I'm realistic to make sure that they understand into what niche they're going to fit in. In my opinion, it's impossible to have a general principle based on different levels of age and degree. I think that the most important. Think is to analyze the potential of the students and work for develop the different characteristics about 
sense of the rhythm, about sense of the polyphony, about technique, about sensitivity, about touch, about sonority, about fusion, to become a complete artist is always a hard work. But I believe that we have to start, first of all, with a special repertoire. For example, I like to start from Bach or Scarlatti, and then Mozart, Haydn and Beethoven, the great classics. With the great classics, we can absolutely grow up the sensitivity about the taste of sonority, about the taste, the musical taste, about the architecture, about the clarity in the sound and the right use of the pedal. And then we can go to the repertoire romantic or of the 20th century. In my opinion, the requirements and expectations are basically the same. To focus on the meaning of the music, to work hard, to have the highest standards, and to always evaluate your progress and ask, what do I need to improve? To work hard, to enjoy learning a variety of musical and non-musical subjects, to be curious and independent. As a piano educator, I think that the most important age to grow up in a, a good way about piano learning is from 8 to 16. This is very important, especially because the teacher almost constructs the student and teaches him all the way to move on the piano technically to understand the scores uh, with um, the explanation of the signs which are there which are very very important and uh, of course, uh, the other important thing is to see the kind of enthusiasm of the student. But naturally, the teacher can help this enthusiasm uh, according the age. I mean, when when I teach to a kid, uh, I try to be very happy and funny uh, to um, help him to understand the music in his own way going on with the age the educator according to me has to understand the ability of the student to construct the piece uh, both technically and musically to understand the structure and to solve the problems which he or she finds in performing the score. In adolescence, I think the important, most important skill for somebody who wants to be a pianist would be physical, technical uh, aspect. The important thing is that we have to train the muscles, we have to train the facility, the hands, develop the muscles and acquire as much as possible the important fundamentals of piano technique but I would say those are probably not the most essential I mean the essential thing is um, 
I mean, during the adolescent time, the um, the choice to become a professional pianist, it's a very important step. And in order to make that step, one have to have a complete love and devotion to the music. I mean, this may sound um, a little strange because when my question at the age of 13, 14, what do you expect the kids to, to do? But I know a lot of people who, when they were in that age, they already had that strong passion for music. And I think that's absolutely important. Um, thing to, to have because without that um, sense of direction no matter um, how much you practice the scales or the, the, the developing the muscles you will still be aimless yeah, we learn technique we learn we train muscles for a purpose, for a musical purpose, for the abilities and the possibilities to express ourselves and to express music on the instrument. It's a very difficult instrument to master, uh, I mean, physically. But only when guided by a higher force, and that higher force I mean the musical aim uh, or a musical purpose. So I think in this way round, I would say the most important skill to develop would be the technique, but the most essential and the must-have ability for someone to become professional pianist is to have this undying passion for music. I think it's very important to understand these um, two sides of things. I think the most important thing is, number one, build a love of music. Number two, build a love of learning. What's really important is that amateur piano students learn basic skills quickly and thoroughly so that they can enjoy playing the piano. Most of the time, especially older, older amateurs, sometimes don't realize how much work playing the piano really is. And so we want to build their basic skills so they're good enough that they can actually play some pieces that they enjoy and not all those early level educational pieces. For younger students, I think we're also building what you might call life skills or skills for success. We're learning the self-discipline of practice, ability to organize work, ability to regulate learning. So it's really important for younger students that they have some opportunities to do some of those things themselves and not always have it driven by an adult. Even if I mainly work with professionals, I totally respect the amateurs. Because I think that amateurs have the same passion for the music compared to the professionals. The think the point is that we have to analyze their time because the, their main work of course is not the music so we have to work specifically on their limited time to practice study and even on the less occasion to perform so we have to get the maximum result considering the shorter time they can dedicate to music. I believe that learning goals for amateur or professional students are the same, and that is to interpret any given piece to the utmost of their potential, helped and guided by the teacher. It is crucial to choose a piece for a student which is level and task appropriate. The teacher who knows uh, more repertoire is at a greater advantage because he can choose a piece which will be specifically suited for the goal that that student is trying to achieve. I love teaching people who are not in a program and are just wishing to um, take a piano for their own enjoyment. Um, 
and although I don't have a lot of experience with these types of students, um, I particularly enjoy th this time with students because they're there f without deadlines of juries, competitions, recitals, things that you would see in a college curriculum. So that makes it particularly um, uh, enjoyable and it, do it doesn't come with that kind of stress. Each amateur, of course, will have their own um, goals or their own parameters of time that they have that they're able to um, study piano. And um, oftentimes uh, the time that they have to play and to practice and prepare is the greatest challenge that they have in their um, in their daily lives. And so it's important that the teacher understand that and work together with the best possible um, result. Um, for me, it's important to take into consideration what would be possible within that time frame. And if it's a little time, I would put less repertoire. Oftentimes, um, amateurs, amateur, amateurs, I'm not even sure what amateurs means, but um, somebody who's not in a program and is doing this for their own enjoyment, um, they don't they don't have consistent time. So in that regard, I would give less repertoire and I would tr try to work with the time management of the time available to make the most enjoyable result for that particular student. Um, another thing that I do like to do with amateurs is, um, well, I'd like to do it with all students, actually, please, I have to correct myself, but that's to um, guide them through and recommend uh, listening. There's so much on YouTube. There's so much um, that's out on the internet that we're able to hear. And that includes pianists who are no longer living. That includes pianists that are young. That includes following competitions that are in progress. It's possible to follow things like the Van Cliver and the Tchaikovsky, any competition really, and to follow that in real time. And that's always exciting for um, musicians, students, amateurs, uh, the, the gamut. So I think being able to offer them a resource of recordings and other activities that they can um, enjoy along with their own study is um, equally important. Um, so in short, I guess my answer comes down to um, finding um, a consistent time element that um, teacher and student are able to work with in the most productive way. For me, it's the same as professional learning, to think deeply about the music and to work hard. The difference is that the long-range goal is not the same. The professional must plan how he or she will make a living as the center of life. The amateur thinks about how the piano will augment and add to his different professional life. For me, the love of music and the enthusiasm and curiosity are to be fostered for any amateur because I think they are definitely going to make the biggest impact on their curiosity and their future learning. think so. The differences are determined more from family attitudes toward education, the love of art and culture, and what constitutes success in life. I think the differences among students and their education in different countries has a lot to do with how they are brought up with their level of education and uh, the cultural differences. However, in an age and time where the internet has made the global village possible, I think it's very difficult to establish uh, different national schools uh, as it used to be 
a lot earlier uh, when the internet did not exist. Uh, so more students are now having access to recordings, master classes, to lessons, uh, uh, as well as this festival, for, for example, uh, that's coming uh, into your homes also via the internet. Uh, so as a result, uh, uh, so many ideas coming from uh, different cultural backgrounds are now mixing together. So I find it a little difficult to establish one school versus another school. I could only say that if somebody grew up in a very isolated environment, um, maybe somebody else would be able, by the way, this person plays, you know, to understand uh, some difference uh, in the background. But it's, it's becoming very hard in many, in many ways. I think it's a very international milieu now. Uh, so that's what I think. In the lessons that I taught in America, Europe, and Asia, I found the students are really quite similar, just like people in general, with their desires, their likes, and their dislikes. The only uh, real important different characteristic from a student to another is, comes from uh, the culture of his country, um, a way to understand the contrast is very different uh, going around in the world. I mean, a Japanese has a very different contrast uh, from an, a, an Italian or European because in literature this is very different. So uh, the most important thing is to help any student to be part of the culture of the composer. I think that personally if I should play Japanese or Chinese music I would need time to understand which are the deep meanings of this music. The same happens uh, for the classical music and for the Western music. In my opinion is yes, but of course you might say that in the United States I'm too close to it because I'm American myself. And when I go teach in other countries, uh, I'm an outsider, so I might not really understand everything. But I'll make a comparison for you. <clears throat> uh, 25 years ago, I did lots of teaching in South America, and I went to Peru very often <clears throat> and worked with students there. Now, in Peruvian culture, like lots of Latin cultures, there's lots of dancing. Peruvian parties are a lot of fun. Everybody from age 2 to age 92 dances. And you don't get asked if you want to dance. You have to dance, and everybody dances. <laughs> and you know what? It's great. Peruvians, of course, sing too, but I would say more frequently are dances. And every Peruvian student learns all the national dances, and they dance them on the holidays, and they dance them for fun. Now, I noticed that my students in China are more tend to be singing. And I have some piano students that have very beautiful singing voices and enter singing competitions and win prizes. So, this also affects their piano study. So, South American students, always very good on rhythm. Always very good on letting the phrases breathe and adjusting tempo to the gesture. They kind of feel that because they dance so much. I would say Chinese students are very good at projecting the melody and bringing that all out. My personal opinion is, this is because that's part of the natural national character, but that's just an observation since I'm not Peruvian, and I'm obviously not Chinese, maybe I'm wrong. Well, maybe before I go to the next question, I should say something about American students. Um, American students are giving, given a lot of latitude towards making their own choices. Mm, there's some good parts to that. I mean, sometimes their interpretations are very personal. I sometimes feel that I wish American students were a little more self-disciplined and would practice harder. So, as an American, I feel free that I can criticize Amer American students, and that's what I think.
regardless of the performance situation, I listen for the strength of artistic conviction and refinement of the interpretation. What is important to me is how well uh, the performer interprets the symbols on the score, how well they use those symbols to create the interpretation of that piece, and how they fuel that interpretation with artistic imagination. Music is about communication, so it is the power of well-constructed and informed artistic message that remains. Considering my expectation from an entrance exam rather than a live recital or a competition, of course there are three, three completely different ways to show something in our skills and abilities. For an entrance exam, I want to understand the potential of the student. That I will work on, where I will work on to develop the, this potential. In the recital, I want to see and to hear a true open artist that gives me a complete open panorama of skills, technical, musical and capacity to move the listener. And when we go in competitions, in competition we have very short time sometimes to understand the potential of the student. In this case, I need to be hit by the totality of the artist, of the professional skills. So it's very important in few time to be absolutely a great performer, to convince the jury for make him advancing to the next step or to give him a prize. Um, and it's a great question because the differences are um, very clear cut in my mind. Um, definitely, I prefer listening to a concert because there's less grading or expectation. It's just simply the enjoyment of music. And essentially that's why we're all here. I mean, we're here because uh, we want to be in music. We love music. We love performance. We love hearing performance. Um, we want to help people um, achieve their goals. And so to go to the concert and be able to hear people um, not have to worry about an evaluation, um, entering a level of degree program or school or program, whatever the case may be, um, just to simply enjoy uh, what a student has prepared in terms of their repertoire or any, any musician has prepared in terms of repertoire um, and performance is just a great joy. I also at this juncture want to make the point that it's something that i feel is is uh less of an activity i find that because of the demands of time and um i know that within my own studio um students have a harder time uh in their own schedules getting out to concerts and i believe that live performance is essential um it needs to be heard there's a big difference between listening to an incredible recording of one of our favorite musicians um, and hearing them in a concert hall. The difference is that, of course, uh, live performance is unedited. It's um, more in the moment. Um, the recordings are you know, equally impressive, but they're coming from a different level of production 
or a different level of preparation. And oftentimes I think students um, are not aware that, that these recordings don't just happen like that, that it's actually an edited process. Um, so oftentimes they're a little bit, you know, taken aback to hear that one of their um, superhero performing, performing pianist, violinist, cellist, singers, whatever the case may be, has made a mistake on stage. And um, of course, we're all human, so that can happen. So um, I digress from my answer, but definitely I enjoy being able to enjoy a performance for for being in that moment in hearing um, the preparation and the presentation and the communication of music. Competitions is trickier because um, every jur jury member will have a different expectation of what they're wanting to hear. And that makes it difficult for any musician being uh, judged in something like a competition. There's no finish line. They're not going to be the first one over it. It's not an Olympic event where you're based on speed or um, time. And so it makes it really incredibly difficult to evaluate. Um, and so oftentimes um, expectations will, um, of course, there's an expectation that there will be a technical ability that will allow the, the um, contestant, the performer, the student that's in the competition to be at a certain level and have the tools to be there. And oftentimes that level is exceedingly high. And um, the competitors in a competition bring this degree of proficiency and impressive ability that sets a standard um, that makes it an incredibly intense environment. Um, oftentimes, because of that intensity and the pressure to be so perfect, a lot of the interpretive, interpretive um, elements go out the window or they're dismissed because there's an intent to be perfect. And my expectation um, as a jury member is to go for that, to, to look for that element, to look for not only the technical proficiency, which of course has to be there, but to look at the personality, the communication, um, the characteristics, the traits of the performer that should be coming through the uh, music in an appropriate um, manner. By appropriate manner, I mean, you know, depending on the genre of what they're, they're playing, that's going to be different if you're um, performing uh, the chromatic fantasy and fugue of Bach, or if you have, um, you know, Rachmaninoff Corelli variations, it's going to be something completely different. So um, that's my expectation. And as I mentioned, um, it's individual for individual jurors. I've had the privilege of being on um, a few international juries um, to the, up to this point. And I find it so interesting that from the first meeting of the jury to the last, I come to understand that the jury, which will uh, has had anywhere from five to uh, nine members, will take on an identity of its own. So although I come to that jury with my expectation or my, my expectation of what I wish to hear, the other juries, of course, the other jurors don't have that similar makeup. And so what happens is that it, it all kind of combines to make uh, a larger um, voice. And um, that's where the decision making can become uh, very, very interesting. And quite honestly, it's important for the, co the contestants to know that um, they often won't agree. You know, if it's a very large competition, you have a large number of jurors, of course, you have a large number of opinions and a variety of feeling. So that makes it a very complex system. I have to say, it's, um, although I'm always 
um, happy to serve on a committee, it it does come with a lot of responsibility, it does come with a lot of um, uh, responsibility, but also intensity and a lot of pressure. Um, the final category was auditions, and that's an interesting category because there is an expectation um, that's quite different from the concert and competition. It's different because that's an entry level. You're looking at somebody auditioning to enter a program of study, and so the expectation as you're listening to them is that you're seeing a demonstration of the necessary, necessary tools and abilities to be able to grow within that program. And um, with experience, um, that becomes a, a, a little bit easier to estimate because you're looking at something that's not knowing. So you're having to do your best guess at evaluating um, the playing that you're hearing, the ability, and being able to understand that in two years, in four years, in three years, whatever, however long the program is, the student is in fact going to be able to accomplish uh, the curriculum and to grow so that they can graduate and um, that they're qualified to have come out of the program. So it's completely different than the competition or the concert. Um, I guess, I am always appreciative that all three have um, significant presence in uh, my current um, career. Basic listening is the same. Does the musician have artistic talent? Is this musician showing me the ideas in the music that I can learn from? Has this musician organized the performance in a way that shows understanding and respect for the composer's intention. Sometimes there may be some differences in listening. If I'm listening to an entrance exam, I may be asking the question, what is the talent and potential of this student? What might this young pianist sound like in five years? Whereas if I'm listening to a concert or a competition, my evaluation is based on what I'm hearing at the present time? Well, I guess you might say the underlying things are the same, but it's a good question because you listen differently. When I go to a concert, I want to be thrilled by the charisma of the performer. I want to be excited by their personality on stage, and I want to learn a new way of thinking about the pieces they're playing, hmm, something that I never thought of before. <clears throat> now, in a competition, it's a little different. In a competition, lots of times the person that's a little more unique doesn't do so well. And so in a competition, lots of times we're looking for lots of subtle things. Can they, is everything well prepared? In, in every way, not just technique, but in expression. Is everything consistent? Can they play through the whole program from beginning to end and be in control? Um, Judges in competitions lots of times like to hear one or two famous pieces, but they also like to hear something that's a little bit unusual. So you might say, as a listener at a concert, I listen like a fan, and for competitions, I listen like a judge. <clears throat> Auditions are similar to competitions in a way. I still want to hear a finished product, but what I'm particularly listening for is something unique about the student that I think could be developed by coming and studying with me. So it's a good question. I listen differently for every time. I don't look for anything different when it comes to listening to a pianist in a different environment, such as uh, an adjudication of a competition or a recital uh, or even an entry examination in the school. I try to look for a personality and I and I hope to hear something a little bit unique about the individual, something special, something different. Um, I do not particularly enjoy listening to uh, performances that sound like photocopies of other performances. 
Um, so I really like when somebody undergoes some deep change uh, so that when that person plays, uh, I hear a voice that is natural and that is uh, quite personal in some ways. It may very well be different uh, from the way I see music, from the way I think, but I do appreciate the differences and I do appreciate to hearing a personality. Well, the expectation for me um, between listening to a concert, uh, judging a competition, and doing an entry exam is that those are essentially three very different uh, formats. Um, I try to enjoy myself when I'm sitting in the concert. Um, I look forward to the personality and the interesting interpretive details. Uh, possibly, I would say I would be most open-minded um, in this situation. And also I, I simply ask myself the question whether I like it or not. Um, when I'm doing a competition or judging a competition, um, one has to be a little more objective. So for example, even if there's some playing that I like it less, let's say, but I have to see the objective value, um, especially when it's comparing to the other competitors. So I think it could have been a situation that somebody's playing I don't like so much, but uh, I have to admit, I have to acknowledge that it is after all a very high level playing. And for that reason, I have to give a objective mark. Probably I won't rank it very high in my scores, but I still have to give a fairly high, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's a more objective evaluation. In the case of entrance exam, uh, I try to look for something more to do with someone's potential. Um, it might be not very refinely done, for example, but if I can see some temperament, some musical sensitivity or technical capacity for example somebody has very big hands or somebody has a, a very good uh, um, for example abilities for certain technical difficulties then I would take into uh, take those things into account um, So I think the general base for me to listen to something, to students, let's say, um, it's still the simple question of liking it or not liking it. Because I think I, I, I need to see myself uh, um, a very immediate reaction to someone's playing. But the afterward, the afterthought of saying okay i like it or no i don't like it so much the the difference is it's uh, um, quite big because of the different formats i find it very important to develop repertoire in multiple directions i think the wider the repertoire the better it is. Possibly with two types of repertoire. One that is determined well ahead of time for examinations or performances or competition. Uh, and another type of repertoire that I think should develop on the side, uh, maybe uh, without asking the student to learn it perfectly well, um, it's important, I think, because otherwise students only work on repertoire for competitions 
or juries or examinations or performances. And so the kind of work that you do in that case is very focused. Uh, the other repertoire should be less focused, but should help the soul in some ways, because you develop an understanding of different types of music. Uh, so that's why chamber music is also extremely important in that sense uh, uh, to create a round musician. Chamber Woman 或者是他的音乐术语另外还有很多的音乐术语这个也是非常非常的重要音乐的本质上去理解的话轻和响就是培养学生的内心听觉所以要把它总结出来是一个最重要的能力的话呢的确
音乐史的西方音乐史的老师，啊，又是一个嗯，这个复调老师，又是一个文学老师，所以作为一个优秀的钢琴教师来说，他必须是集呃所有的音乐专业的这个老师的这个能力在一身，这样你对学生的培养才能够。呃，从一个全方位的这个角度去挖掘，去启发学生去进行音乐的探索，那么这样的话呢，你才能够让学生自己通过几年的这个跟着老师的这个学习以后，他会发掘出，呃，形成他自己的一种对于音乐的一个理解和挖掘。那么，因为音乐的作品实在太多，我们在学习期间就几年，不可能把所有的曲目都去研究过。那么，一旦学生能够掌握了读谱的能力、研究乐谱的能力，啊，那么相应的，他如果手上的技术也被培养到了相当的程度，我相信他就会。逐渐逐渐的变成一个优秀的钢琴老师、钢琴家，呃，一个有内涵的、有修养的一个，呃，钢琴演奏者。For me, the most important skills developed in adolescence are dedication to exploring and understanding the meaning of the music, developing good study and learning attitudes. Experience a wide variety of repertoire, and participating in chamber music if possible. If there are no strings or winds available, perhaps forehand music or two piano would be helpful. You know, I get asked that question on panels a lot, and sometimes I have a different answer than my colleagues. I think the most important skill in teenage years is to develop a good technique, number one, and to develop good listening skills. Now, <clears throat> some some people will say, "No, the most important thing is to develop expression and interpretation." But you know, we know from studies about learning that both the physical part of piano technique and the mental part of learning pieces is a lot easier when you're younger. I remember one time I had a student, a 14 years old girl. And she was not a tall person, but she had pretty big hands, and so big stretches weren't a problem for her. And she wanted to learn the Tchaikovsky Concerto. So I asked the distinguished American pianist, Abby Simon, who at that time was teaching at Indiana University, if he thought it was a good idea for her to learn the Tchaikovsky Concerto at that young age. And he said, well, it won't be good now when she's 14. But when she's 34, she will have played it for 20 years. So I think that's a good comment. It is good to learn those hard pieces from the young. It is good to get your technique good, and then the interpretation matures as the performer matures. Um, my answer to this is going to be uh, on the short side because I have not had a great amount of experience in this area. Um, in the students that I've had in this age group generally have um, come to me because they do have a serious um, intention to pursue music at the college level. And I find that that um, would color this answer because um, it's my responsibility to prepare them for auditions, to for things that are coming ahead and challenges that uh, I would have in my studio with these students is that um, they're having to balance their piano study and their practice time um, while uh, managing usually a highly demanding academic program at their uh, high school level and in their studies. So the ability to balance and manage um, academic courses and then the music practice which really should be happening every day is sometimes quite impossible um, and of course that becomes really stressful and bottom line is that although there's so much discipline involved in what we're doing um, in communicating uh, goals with students um, oftentimes 
that turns students off and they become less enthusiastic about studying and they, they don't enjoy, they don't, they don't wish to continue because it's not fun anymore. And so that balance of creating something that's enjoyable, but yet something that needs to be disciplined is really tricky. Um, the other thing I, that is important um, during that time, I think it's important to remember that um, kids are growing and oftentimes quite rapidly in a short amount of time. So that means that things like uh, their height at the bench, their technique, their approach to the piano, the growth of a hand, oftentimes, um, you know, um, uh, they're growing uh, inches in a very short amount of time. And I have to remind myself that those adjustments have to be made and kind of looked at. Um, otherwise they can get into trouble with um, uh, just aches and pains and some injuries along the way. The most important things to understand and to learn are about control of Ourself, control of the body, control of our emotions, so we could be able to bring to the public our idea of the music we are going to play without interferences. Because sometimes uh, if we don't know very well what to do in a certain passage, in a certain structure, we could give to the public an idea very different from what we think about the music we, we, we are going to play. So, for me, the most important is to learn the control. Students should be exposed to ear training, dictation, music history, music theory, chamber music, and they should continuously study general academic subjects. It is all of these areas that will help students develop their knowledge and their thought. Without refined thought and knowledge, it is impossible to create convincing and exciting interpretations. In addition to this, Students should always work on the agility of their pianism and they should try to acquire as much repertoire as possible. Their imagination, musicality, general knowledge, eagerness to learn. His ability to understand the harmonic differences in a score, so how they move in the structure, the ability to change the sound, so it's a kind of technical ability, of course a general technical ability, and the ability to sight read how fast he can learn a piece. Well, the question of evaluating a new student, I think um, there are three criteria generally, body, mind, and soul. Uh, in the case of piano studying, I think body means um, physical ability, technical ability, mind meaning uh, the line of thought, um, the ability to to think, to have an in uh, independent um, understanding. The soul, obviously, meaning uh, um, the commitment, the temperament, the personality, and the uh, I would say the feeling side of music. So I try to evaluate through those three categories. I think um, obviously nobody is very well balanced uh, at a very early age. So normally when they achieve the age of, I don't know, 
27, 28 onward, one start to find uh, a graduate balance between those three things. Um, when I'm accepting the new students, I often find one element pretty strong, the other two slightly weaker, let's say. So, um, but as long as there are some shining point, or let's say some uh, um, interesting elements coming through one of those three categories, I would be interested in the student. I feel that I can teach a new student how to play the piano and how to understand the composer's intention. So what I'm looking for is talent, curiosity, a sense of wonder, dedication and working hard, and integrity and honesty. I think the research is very clear on this. Two things are the most important thing. Having a good ear and the ability to hear the difference in sounds. The scientific term for that is called audiation. And the second thing is having motivation to learn and work hard. If you have those two things, everything else can be learned. If you don't have those two things, it's not going to work. I think the intelligence of the student is very important to me. Uh, it's, it's important that a student be bright, uh, capable of cooperating, um, able to make instant changes, and so this person must really be a good listener, uh, must develop the ear to a great extent. I find that uh, of the utmost importance. I'm always attracted by personality, and I think that there is not a regional characteristic for a great personality, because it's a matter of personal sensitivity to the life. It is true that, for example, Latins are more easily um, drive to, 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 to sing with the, with the performance, because they are close to the opera style. And it is true that usually Orientals are more dedicated to sacrifice in their hard work and they reach great results with the technical skills. As in the Russian world, and it is true that Orientals are able to get closer to the European style, world, culture. But it is impossible to, to say this is a characteristic of this regional place because talent goes over. When a talent and the personality shows its power, we can see an open mind. 360 degrees. It means that there are no boundaries about the music because music is a universal language. So we don't need to come from a specific geographic area to understand the greatness of the music. In Italy, you can basically study music everywhere. It is plenty of um, uh, private schools. We have uh, musical middle and high schools. We have the conservatories and we have a national state academy and also some private high academies. The problem in Italy, I think, is in the primary school. There we don't have a good plan for education in music and the government should be invest more in that. In New York City, where I live, there are numerous opportunities for pursuing music education outside of a standard conservatory environment. 
There are many after-school programs for uh, children. There are community schools, individual teaching studios, festivals, pedagogical incentives organized by teachers' organizations or otherwise. The music education in the world, uh, it is different, of course, because of many reasons. But one of them, which I really consider very well about the, the education outside of Italy, is the kind of organization and the importance given to the students and to their growing up. The, of course, also the opportunities, I mean, just for example, in, in, uh, in the uh, USA universities are very good for the students. They provide a lot of possibilities uh, to perform and to, to new things about performing and music. Uh, they are very open. Uh, anyway, I think that the most important uh, everywhere is not only the organization or the structure of the place in, in which you go to learn, but I think that is very very important the relationship between teacher and student because sometimes students uh, think to a teacher like a father or mother and so there is a very big responsibility and so I think this is mostly the same everywhere the other differences are around this center which is the most important for me well, again, I've taught in a lot of different places. I guess China and South America are the two places I've been most frequently. But of course, I've been all over Southeast Asia and Korea and to Europe. I sometimes joke and say the only continent I haven't been to is Antarctica. So I might have some ideas about this one. Um, I would say we have a problem in piano education all around the world. And a lot of the teaching at our conservatories is geared to concert pianists. So we turn out some very fine pianists that don't know how to teach. And we also turn out some teachers who don't know all the fine points of developing piano. So we have this divide between people that think they're going to be performers and people that plan on being teachers. And in my opinion, we've got to bring those closer. Now, is that specific to any one country? Every country is a little different, but I think it's a worldwide problem. You know, in today's world, everybody teaches. Hargrich teaches. I heard Kissin say in an interview he has some students. So even the very top, top, top of concert pianists teach today. So we have to do a good job of teaching those fine pianists how to teach. And we also have to raise the level of the lower grade pianists, so they also could be fine teachers. So that's what I think that one of the big challenges in piano education is. I believe each student will benefit most by asking what are the ideas and advice that I can use not just once or twice, and not just today or tomorrow, but if possible, for the rest of my life. I know I have heard some advice from teachers 50 years ago that I still try and do each day. I think the most important thing is they get inspired by being around all the outstanding professors. And they also get inspired and learn from each other. And <clears throat> being in Italy doesn't hurt. So those are the things I think are most important. I think that there is not an important thing that can represent this festival. I think that all the part of this festival 
can benefit the students completely because they can attend to such a great um, world, musical world, from the lectures to the lessons to the recitals of the faculty to the evaluation masterclass. So this festival has a perfect mix, a perfect combination of elements to develop and share the true musical experience. The biggest benefit of a festival like this for the students is the exchange of information and to listen to the colleagues' lessons had from different, by different teachers. This is a little bit tricky for me to say because different people look for different things and they absorb in different ways. So the strength of a festival is the number of variant educational opportunities that students can take advantage of, um, particularly uh, performances, so the opportunity to allow students to perform, I find it very important, but also it's equally important that they uh, stay involved in musical activities such as lectures, presentations, you know, uh, moments of uh, depth that are created by anyone who is giving uh, a talk on a particular subject. So there are, I think, multiple educational experiences uh, that different people take advantage of. So uh, the more, the better. Of course, there must be a limit and there should be a good balance uh, you know, in all these activities. But I don't think uh, the festival should be focused on just one activity. All around the world we have different systems in education and music. For example, I admire particularly the Russian system that starts from taking care of young talents and they hard very work to develop um, their career. And I like also the American system with a PhD but I strongly believe that it is very important to give the possibility to reach a high specialization in the different areas that music has. For example, solo performance, chamber music performance, teaching and, of course, accompaniment for singers and dance. According to the different personal skills and desires of the students. What is better and which do I prefer? Each person has to decide that for themselves. My father used to say that he learned from all his teachers. That is good advice. I think it is very helpful to participate in different systems of music education. I know I felt sometimes disappointed that the United States does not have a more professional system of primary music schools and high school conservatories similar to Asia and to Russia and perhaps even to Europe. But that means that in the United States we have to be more creative and more determined that talented young musicians have the support and opportunities they need and they deserve. Uh, yeah, that's true. In, uh, in Europe, sometimes it's more of a performer's diploma. The United States has many doctorates. That's all true. Um, well, my answer to this one is it's hard to know as an outsider. And every system of music education has to suit the character of the country it's in. So I wouldn't presume to criticize other countries. I would say that again, the, the big problem is we're not always doing a good job 
training our students for the realities of what their world is going to be today. I did an interesting bit of research for one of my presentations in which I studied the curriculum at the Leipzig Conservatory. <clears throat> you might be surprised to know that Leipzig Conservatory was the first conservatory. I think it was founded in the 1830s, somewhere around there, by Mendelssohn. And you know what? The curriculum is very similar to the conservatory curriculum today. <clears throat> in fact, I think in some ways it's better than the conservatory curriculum today. So what I'd like to see happen is well, for us to go back and look at those old models and see if we can get some good ideas from Mendelssohn, from all those other famous people. But we also have to accept the reality of the world today with teaching how it is today and students how they are today. And by that I mean increased reliance on um, technology and a more balanced approach to teaching. In my musical life, I have been privileged to meet very different types of musicians, uh, from those who were highly trained academically uh, to those uh, uh, who were expert performers. And, uh, and I think that what I found out for myself is that, uh, and I knew probably already from the early years, is that a degree in itself does not necessarily make a musician better. Uh, Certain types of musicians, of course, will benefit from being enrolled in formal education in an institution. Uh, and, but I think it's always the, the smart person who uh, has a lot of curiosity that given the opportunities uh, that a musical education can offer, then that person will be able to uh, do something with it. So I have seen, again, a number of people who were extremely bright, uh, a number of people who could absolutely present lecture recitals at the very same level, if not any better than any of the best uh, doctoral students. Uh, and uh, these musicians did not have a doctorate. So it is very difficult to create categories and to be very dogmatic. And I think that a very important key lesson here for myself is that self-learning is the most important thing. Uh, we must take pride and we must take responsibility over our own education. We cannot only expect that such education will be given to us. It is not enough. I grew up in former Yugoslavia where professional music schools were available from age six. They gave excellent structure and discipline to music students from early age through conservatory years. In the United States, there is greater flexibility and students may begin later or focus later on their music studies and still find a valuable role in the music world. I find both philosophies to be equally beneficial and important. Generally speaking, the emphasis is shifting toward the importance of acquiring a DMA or PhD degree especially in the United States, but also in Europe. I believe uh, this is due to the tendency of nurturing a multifaceted artist, artist with many skills. Artist who is a performer, soloist and chamber musician, a teacher, researcher, recording artist, administrator, and so forth. Thinking back in time, we can see how having multiple skills they find musicians like Bach, Mozart, Clementi, and how that changed later, specifically in 20th century, when artists, generally speaking, focused on developing skills within one area. Now, the pendulum is swinging back. We see how developing multiple skills is very important again. And this, of course, is mirrored in music education and general trends in music. 刚才我们听了专家教授各自的发言，相信给大家带来很多的启发。那么，通过一次论坛，不一定解决很多实际的问题，但我相信，在大家今后的教学与工作中，一定会带来很多新的灵感和冲击。那么，我特别希望大家能
多多的参与这些钢琴教学法的研究的论坛，然后也提出各自的呃心得和体会，那么。让大家能够在这样的研讨当中，共同的提高，共同的进步。祝大家下安。